However, there is another type of offender who not only inflicts emotional abuse, but damages the victim physically as well. This next man, Gerald, is a sadistic sex offender. As he'll tell us, he is sexually aroused by inflicting pain. The victim he's describing is his nine-year-old stepson. After about two years of molesting my son, and all the pornography that I had been buying, renting, swapping. I had gotten my hands on some bondage and discipline pornography with children involved. And uh, some of the reading that I had done and the pictures that I had seen showed total submission, uh, forcing the children to do what I wanted. And I had eventually started using some of this bondage and discipline with my own son. And uh, it had escalated to the point where I was putting a large Ziploc bag over his head and taping it around his neck with black duct tape, or black electrical tape, and raping and molesting him at that point, uh, to the point that he would turn blue, pass out. Uh, at that point, I would rip the bag off his head uh, not for fear of hurting him, but because of the excitement. I was extremely aroused by inflicting pain. And uh, when I seen him pass out and change colors, that was very arousing and heightening to me. And I would rip the bag off his head, and then I'd jump up on his chest, and I'd masturbate in his face and, and uh, make him suck my penis while he was, you know, as he started to come back awake, while he was coughing and choking, I would rape him in the mouth. I, uh, I used the same sadistic style act of the plastic bag and the tape two, three times a week, and that went on for, i say, a little over a year. If I hadn't been arrested when I was, my stepson would be dead. I would have killed him. I had been fantasizing about killing a victim during the course of, of rape or molest about five or six months uh, all during the course of the molestation of my stepson when I was using the zip layer of the plastic bag over his head uh, I had fantasized and thought about killing him, letting him go ahead and suffocate during the process of the molestation uh, I believe it would have been maybe as short as another month or two, and I would have actually killed him if I was not arrested. Gerald's sadistic attacks continued, despite the fact that his stepson reported him repeatedly. No one believed the child. It was reported to my wife and my parents, uh, probably six or seven different times. Uh, and there was actually one instance where I went to the police station myself to turn, my turn myself in. And the police day, the officer at the desk told me to go home and sleep off my drunk. And I left. Uh, if it wasn't for the fact that they had found, my landlord had found some pornographic pictures of my son in the attic of the home where we were living, I would probably still be molesting. As you might expect, Gerald didn't confine his sexual assaults to the home. In fact, he had a lengthy history of attacking children outside the home as well. He had molested children from ages 4 to 16, with a preference for 10 to 14-year-old boys. I've been raping and molesting for over a period of 25 years, and I have in excess of 300 victims. Hands-on victims? All hands-on victims. Okay. How did you get access to so many victims? Uh, children are on the street all the time. I made, uh, created my own opportunities. There were children at stores. Uh, I had picked some children up at the stores, at uh, penny arcades, and I have snatched some off the street. Now, did you? By pick them up, do you mean by grooming? You talk them into it, or do you mean violently grab them and kidnap them? Sometimes there, there had been some violent kidnapping. 
snatching a child off the street, pulling him into my car, taking him to a deserted area, raping and molesting him, and then taking him back to where I had snatched him from. Uh, there had been uh, incidents where I would groom the child with toys, money. I'd see a child in a store uh, standing around the, the toy displays and I would offer to buy the toy that this child would, may be looking at and would actually walk up to the counter and pay for the toy and walk out of the store with the child and the toy. And then I would, after, after I had taken the child to a deserted area or a, whole, a house that I had actually fixed, fixed up for the purpose of raping and molesting children, I would take the child back to the store where I had got him from and leave him off at the front door and leave. Gerald covered up his raping and molesting by living what might be called the double life. Friends and associates had no clue he was a violent man. Uh, I believe I, I feel more that I led a triple life. Uh, okay. I had to be, I was one way at home, I was one way at work, and I was a different way in the community. Uh, when I was at home, I was a molesting monster. I would rape and molest. Uh, when I was in the community, I was more of a stalker. I would be stalking people, stalking children, looking for victims. Uh, when I was more with uh, my employers or the in crowd that I was in, it was something, I was completely different as, oh, I'm the perfect individual, you know, have a good paying job, drive a nice car, dress nice and uh, go to a lot of high-class, fancy places. Uh, and this is the life, this is what I would portray to the people that I wanted them to see, my friends, my employers, uh, business associates. This is what I would portray to them. What people didn't know about going on in my home was uh, a lot of extreme violence. Beating my son up, uh, beating my wife up. If my wife wouldn't have sex with me when I wanted it, where I want, or how I wanted it, I would beat her up and then rape her after I'd beat her. I had beaten my son into unconsciousness a number of times. Uh, and then I would keep him sometimes kept locked up in the house until his bruises healed up. Keep him away from school, keeping him away from his friends. Nobody around me knew what I was doing. Nobody around my community knew that I was such a violent individual in the home. If they did, they never said anything, but I don't believe they ever knew because I was completely and totally different outside of the house once I left the home. Even sadists often make thinking errors to rationalize the abuse, but these errors are different from the errors that non-sadists make. While non-sadists tell themselves that they are loving children, Sadists such as Gerald often tell themselves that their victims deserve the treatment that they are getting. Well, I, I devalued all, all children, both step in biological children and other ch others' children, uh, mostly others and my stepchild. Uh, I said my, I told myself that my stepchild, you know, because he wasn't mine, because he wasn't my biological son, that he was less than human anyway. Uh, other people's children that I had raped and molested, they weren't mine. They weren't my biological children, so it didn't make any difference to me. I viewed children as a piece of meat. Just, uh, to, me, to me, children were a toy. I'd do what I wanted with and then throw it away. Gerald did make one unusual thinking error, which is not typical for this kind of offender. Even though he knew the children he was attacking were suffering and he wanted them to suffer because suffering was sexually arousing to him, he still managed to find a way eventually to maintain almost a dual kind of awareness. He was able to enjoy the suffering and at the same time still tell himself the child wanted it to happen. The thinking process for th that I used it with uh pain and, and how arousing I found it was uh, if a child was screaming uh, 
I would tell myself that, you know, it's the child's not really hurting because I know I, I in all reality I know it was hurting the child. But the only way that I could continue the act was to tell myself that I wasn't hurting the child. I really wasn't hurting him or her. And I found the more I told myself that, the more I believed it. And then I found that if the child tried to pull away or would scream, holler, cry, and, and all my lying to myself would enhance that and make it more arousing to me. And the pain, the, the aspect of inflicting pain was extremely arousing. It was something that had taken time to build up. It didn't just happen. It took time to build that up. Uh, <clears throat> and after a while, I, would take and, I could actually take and turn it around to the child was screaming because they wanted more. The child was screaming actually because they liked it. Uh, the child was screaming because they wanted me to continue. And it's all turning it around and, and saying that, that uh, well, the tears really aren't real for hurt. The screaming isn't really because of pain. It's that the person actually wants this to happen. And that's how I was turning it around. And I had told myself this so many times that I believed it. And did you do that at the time, or did you rework it in your <clears throat> later? When I first found that I was becoming, that I was really aroused to inflicting pain, uh, I didn't have to work. I, I didn't have it, that line of thinking right then. Okay, I knew that I was hurting them. It took me some time, and I worked it through at a later time. I'd. I'd I'd work it over half hour, hour, 45 minutes, hour and a half later that this child was asking for it, this child wanted more. And the more that I thought about it that way, the more that I looked at it, there came a point in my life after six, seven months of doing this that I didn't even have to change the thought process anymore. The immediate thought process was scream, pain, excitement, they wanted it. There was no change after that. I had told myself so much I, that I had built it into it. It was a built-in thinking process at that process at that point that that child was crying, screaming, because they wanted me to inflict the pain. No matter how much I hurt them, there, was, there were incidents and cases of where uh, tissue had been torn, blood, and I know there was pain. But I had no remorse for it. I didn't feel sorry for it. I was aroused to that. And the child screaming made the arousal even higher. It's obvious that this offender and other sadists do not have empathy for their victims. But it would be a mistake to think that a victim empathy program would help. 